The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Welcome to the Quirky Dog Podcast, inspired by some of the quirkiest dogs you can ever imagine and the owners who love them. This podcast is brought to you by the quirky couple themselves, Scott and Jess Williams. Their aim is to educate and entertain. Here's Scott and Jess. Welcome, guys, and happy Wednesday. We are coming to you live here today from Salem, New Hampshire, and we are super excited to talk to you today about dogs and energy and more understanding how our energy can affect our dogs. But first, we're going to start with the quirky tip of the day. And the quirky tip is... Do you want to be my Vanna White? Well... We have these uh, biothane dog collars that you can get printed with your dog's name and phone number on them. Stamped. I'm loving them. I'm yeah, loving them. It doesn't come off. It's pretty good. So it's a nice waterproof collar. It works well. If your dog gets lost, it's nice to have a phone number on there. I'm not crazy about putting the dog's name on my collars because I don't want someone to find my dog, know my dog's name, and build a relationship up with my <laughs> dog and then keep him. So I would rather put the word reward. Yeah. And the phone number. Call me. I'm going to pay you. Didn't say how much it's going to be, but there's going to be money in it for you if you get my dog back to me. That's I'm super. Little, little I'm super tip. pumped about these though. Um, Ninja Bling out in Missouri is making them. Uh, my friend Tracy Custer from a long time ago. She's a cool disc dogger. So check it out. But before I've only been able to get those with cloth, and I always have to wash them. So I'm pumped about the bio thing. Maybe put a link in there on our. Oh, maybe page. a little link. Yeah, little uh, little link out. All right, we are going to talk about energy and dogs. So. How did this podcast... Well, first, we got to talk about our farmhounds. So if you have not mm -hmm. seen last week's podcast with the farmhounds interview, I'm so pumped about farmhounds. Our dogs are loving farmhounds. And this rawhide right here, I would say each of our dogs have had over an hour with it. It's probably been in our house for two weeks and it's still rocking. So yeah. I am obsessed with these guys. Yeah. When I hear rawhide, it just scares yeah, the crap freak out, out of me. With, yeah. I don't like... I've heard so many negative, you know, rawhide stories about intestinal blockage and things like that. So we wanted to try this out. It was originally an eight inch long, I think it was, yep. uh, rolled rawhide. And so we gave it to my Malinois who has a monster grip and crunch and big bite. And he chewed on that thing for 45 minutes and maybe took an eighth of an inch off the end of it or something. It cleaned teeth. It, they we were it to able to really enjoy it for a long time. Yeah. Everybody's poop was great. So go check out last yeah. week. There's a link for a discount. We're obsessed with farmhounds. And if you have heavy chewers, definitely the hides. We had to show you to prove it because no, we're so freaking excited. I just want to conclude with that being said, you don't just give your dogs things like this and let them go out yeah. in the yard and chew it unsupervised for three or four hours. Yeah. Moving along. <laughs> All right. So energy and dogs, obviously you guys know it from, you know, if you get the flu or something and you're kind of down for a few days, your dogs normally, hopefully if they are good dogs and they're trying to be there for you, they mirror your energy in a certain way and maybe they're down for the count too. They can do a little less activity. They can be there with you. We negatively and positively affect our dog's energy pretty much with every mood we are in, um, no matter where our dogs are at. So you started talking about energy as far as like expending energy like physical well, energy. I think the reason that I um, wanted to break down this energy issue a little bit more is because when I talk to clients about energy, what they're thinking about is physical energy, expending physical energy. They're trying to exhaust their dog so that their dog is better behaved, more just more pleasant to be around, which is totally understandable. Um, and that is one aspect of energy I thought we could talk about briefly. But then there's the other aspects of energy where, and there's several different things that we listed, but how dogs um, affect each other uh, in a pack uh, situation, like a dog daycare, for example, where you can have 25 dogs in there having a great time and it's peaceful and playful and calm and, and looks really nice, safe. And then you get one dog in there, a new dog is added that was evaluated, that isn't aggressive, but its energy level is hectic. It's just a high, strong dog. And maybe it's a little more vocal. Maybe it's a little bit, you know, you know, it's getting into those kind of type of noises. And that freaks out other dogs. And then they like, what the frig is up with this dog? And then you can have a dog that was well-behaved, maybe had been in that dog daycare for two or three years, and all of a sudden it attacks another dog. And why? Because the dynamics of the energy in that dog daycare changed, and it brought something up in the other dogs, and one of them, went too far. And then that dog gets kicked out. And the dog that 
is the reason for it is still there, you know? Yeah. So that's so just another aspect of energy. There's a, there's a lot of different, and that's not even what Jess was talking about with your own energy or emotional state can heavily and typically will heavily impact your dog, just like it would impact your kids. If you had a terrible day at work and you had bad traffic and you come in the door all pissed off, your kids are not going to be getting <laughs> under your feet. They're going to be like, give the guy yeah. a wide berth because he obviously had a bad day. It's the same kind of thing with the dogs, you know? Completely. And while it seems nice, like, oh, I want to wear the dog out and I want to take the dog for a walk and I want to, you know, throw the ball for the dog so the dog is tired, physical exercise is all fine and good. And you are going to be able to take the edge off sometimes, just like, you know, you might sleep better if you run a mile at the gym a day rather than if you don't or if you go outside and, you know, you power walk outside in the fresh air. But the energy that we're talking about is this very like palpable energy where, like Scott says, there's a certain feel in the room and then someone else enters it and that totally changes. So to be completely frank, um, it's been a pretty crazy few weeks at our house. I have been going through some stuff and everything else. One of our older dogs I've been worried about. He's been drinking more water. He's been acting more anxiously, like almost like hyperventilating, like, uh, uh, like nervous. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on? So I said to Scott last week, I said, call, get him an appointment. Let's get some blood work, everything else. Well, lo and behold, I'm starting to steady my sleep. I'm starting to regulate my emotions and I'm starting to be able to, on a day-to-day basis, feel a little bit more like Jess Williams, my normal self. This dog is completely recovered. So even in our own house... And I will add, my stomach was bad while she was... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't eat a thing. I got... <laughs> He's on probiotics. I lost 10 pounds He's on with probiotics. her emotional Everybody, distress. Everybody's getting something around here. No, but- and I told her, that's a bonus. <laughs> she lost a few pounds because she was feeling down. And then she's like, oh, I'm losing weight. I said, great. Nice. You wanted to lose we it. Got there a you perk. go. But even with us, you guys, we are professional dog trainers. We have dogs who are are very well trained. Uh, We are always evaluating what's going on. We're seeing this kind of fallout and we're seeing this kind of effect even within our own household. Scott brought up um, daycares and everything. And that's a really interesting one when you look at the way that dogs and other animals affect energy. Pack mentality is a freaking thing, you guys. Like, I don't know how else to breach that topic besides if there's going to be a 10 different animals there that's they're going to act a lot differently as 10 of them than there would be just one or two you know what i mean and i've seen this firsthand where all of a sudden there's a bunch of dogs like scott said somebody screams or some loud yip and then all of a sudden the dogs just like boom like they're all on that animal not aggressive dogs not anything it's just they're all acting in a pack so these are all the types of energy that we're talking about Can so I use yes, a current analogy go, to kind of help with that it. pack mentality I'm all about analogies you get a group of people together <laughs> to go protest at the capitol oh boy okay? here we go they, the majority of these people went there, I think, with the intention of pr- peaceful protest. But all of a sudden, the dynamic changed mm-hmm. because someone was putting some things into their head. And maybe it only took one person to throw the first bottle or rock or flag or stick. But the whole crowd all of a sudden shifted. Mm-hmm. The crowd, a lot of those people, not all, but a lot regretted what they didn't come there to do that they didn't know what was up and there were so you know but it was a it was a crowd psychosis a crowd thing shift you know and and there's early on in my life i you know was reading a lot about how to control crowds because i thought it was interesting you know and it, and it goes into the lecturing from a stage maintaining everyone's attention and um which hitler was a genius a natural genius at getting people's attention grabbing it and people are just like what the heck is up with this guy you know and dogs don't necessarily have a natural leader so much i mean obviously in the wild with wolves and everything you have more of this like alpha omega thing where there's a clear leader and everything else but if you have you know a whole calm pack of dogs and then you introduce a dog in there with a very high energy there's going to be a different feel same thing with fear you get a lot of that with Mm. fear so you have a bunch of dogs that are super confident you introduce a fearful dog into that that nervous energy all of a sudden starts they they, start all looking around like what's going on like uh, they don't look around i think natural inclination is to kill fear (laughs) dogs want to kill fear you get one dog that's screaming that's in pain or something and dogs like go at it quick yeah this like this prey this prey yeah they hear that high picture they sense a weakness and they want to kill it and that's just something that goes back thousands of years it's not that you can't stop this and train and and make not allow that to happen you can certainly control the environment 
But if you let dogs be dogs, things can get crazy real quick. Yeah. And then the other thing we're going to introduce here before break, and then we're going to tell you how your energy can change and how you can more positively affect all these situations, are kids. Kids are a really big one to consider. A lot of dogs don't freaking like kids, and that's fine. Like, I don't blame them. I get it. Like, they're little miniature humans, and they're screaming and snotty, and they're scary. I will say that I would rephrase that and say that they don't dislike kids. They get nervous around yes. the energy yes. of a certain yes. children. They're unsure. You could be around a nursery school. You could take a group of kids to see a dog, and the dog could be good with eight out of nine or ten kids, and there's one kid there that the dog is like, I just can't take this kid around my face, you know? So, and that's the, and the other thing I was thinking about with, um, like, when dog bites happen, and quite often, there's an awkward pause before a bite. A dog will freeze when they're stressed, f- fearful, tense, not, you know, they're not sure what's up. When they freeze, that's, for me, a sign, stop moving forward, <laughs> don't get in this dog's space, give this dog some room, preferably move him around, get his body moving because he's getting locked up and he's going to make a bad choice. But kids don't know that. So a kid can get in the dog's face, the dog can freeze up stressed and the kid just keeps coming in and, and then boom it happens and it's also know? kids when they're learning to move and stuff they they're they're moving their arms like they kind of look like weird like mutants. Oh, yeah. like it's very concerning so all of this stuff the dog's seeing this it's sensing pressure if you're not reacting in a certain way then you can get to an issue okay so we got energy and how it affects dogs and now we're going to tell you how to have all the energy affect the dogs in a good way after break we'll see you after the commercial all right, we are back. We had a little uh, Coranda fun, but we're going to still have the link. So I if would you say don't, that, that know... was a mindfulness moment. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about. Well, we got to do our quirky question of the day, real quick. Where's the question? You're just the squeaking pig guy. Oh. Come on now. All right, the quirky question of the day was: My dog has separation anxiety. What should I do about it? Big topic. We're going to condense it quick. What are your thoughts? Well, I would just say structure. It depends. There's so many variables with that. It's not easy to give a straightforward answer because some dogs are anxious because they just got put in a new home. You don't need to do anything. Let them settle in. It might take a month. They're all better. There's different. You might be creating the anxiety, and that's another issue. Then you have to start changing your behavior. But quite yeah. often, just uh, regardless of when, how, or why it's happening, by implementing some structure into that dog's life, will start to ease the anxious behavior. And I would say my three-pronged approach normally, and I've probably said this in some way, shape, or form before on the podcast, is crating is a big one. Crating is really important when you're home, when you're not home overnight, that the dog can stay in a crate and deal. Uh, Stepping on the leash is a big one. We have a YouTube video on that on our Canine Healing YouTube page, but that's an exercise that's really helped. The dog is near you, but you're not necessarily touching the dog. And then the third one, if you want to do some training, is teaching the dog to go to bed. They're actually stabilized away from you in the same room. So so those are our three big ways to combat it. Um, we're not super big on going straight to medication. People have had some luck with CBD, but try some behavior modification. And if you haven't yet, for sure work with a trainer because trainers are seeing anxiety in every way, shape, or form, separation or not. Okay, so let's talk about the ways that we can affect our dogs in a positive way. So let's talk about we had a bad day at work. We're coming home. Maybe the whole family's there, the dog's there, everything else. How can we change our energy so when we walk in, we don't make the dog's day more stressful and the whole family's day shit? Well, uh, I guess that really starts with emotional maturity. Oh, good one. (laughs) So you're having a shit day. Does that mean that everyone that you interact with moving forward has to also have a shit day? I would hope not. No. No. So So. one good thing is these transitions, you guys. So we always talk about this with the dogs too. So like going through the door, take a deep breath, like get your head, reframe your head space, take two minutes in the car, take 30 seconds, not on your phone before you go inside, reframe your head space. Don't bring your work into your house and that chaos into your house. What you say when you walk in the door, how you breathe when you walk in the door, the way you exhale and (laughs) the moans that you make when you do that, all of that matters and all of that affects everyone. So it's not that you always have to be on your best behavior, but you're going to see your dog change in very drastic ways, depending on how you walk in. So when you walk in all hustle bustle on the phone, grocery bags everywhere in a complete tiz, throwing everything everywhere. The dog wakes up from a nap, hopefully. And now the dog's all of a sudden in a world whirlwind. Maybe you don't let the dog out. Now all of a sudden you can get an accident. You know, the dog's nervous, your energy's nervous, everything else. That's a common sign of anxiety and stress that people don't realize is dogs actually urinating and defecating in the house right when you're there. That's not necessarily a potty training issue. That's, oh my God, you're stressing me out. I'm not sure what to do. I'm going to pee. 
Uh, maybe I'll feel better if I pee. It's a way to release it. So check yourself. Give yourself a moment to be like, okay, I'm re-entering my house. I'm re-entering the space. Scott and I are big on smudging. We like to smudge and, you know, have the energy of our whole house change and do that. So, you know, maybe you haven't smudged in a while. Maybe you don't know what smudging is. Maybe you just do this small practice where you're like, okay, I'm going to light incense. And after I light this incense, I'm going to reframe the way I'm thinking about things and the way I'm treating my family members and my animals and everything else. As far as stress levels uh, that like for a fearful dog, let's talk about that because I always think that you should Could really I, counteract that. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just add to that when you get yeah. home and you're having a rough day? Before you interact with uh, anybody else, take care of yourself. Yeah. It's just like putting the oxygen on your face in the airplane. Yep. You get in the door, you don't start taking care of your kids and your family and the dog and this and that. Go in, take your coat off. If you have a need to have a beer, you want to have a glass of wine, whatever it is, take five minutes for yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe take a hot shower, you know, and then you come out with a rush, a new attitude and feeling a little better and saying, okay, well, life sucked <laughs> out there, but life is good in here. I'm ready to bring Where's it back Where's my in. damn dog? <laughs> now we're talking uh, energy where we're, there's fearful energy. So this is always like a really strong th- way that trainers should approach a fearful dog, I would say, is that, you know, you have a dog that's nervous. If you're real nervous about that situation, you're real unsure and your energy is, I'm not super committed and you're not super certain about how you're going to handle that situation, the dog sent- senses that uncertainty and it all raises up. So, for instance, if we have a dog that's really fearful, we're going to show them a lot of direction. We're going to show them a lot of leadership. We're going to be like, come on, buddy, we're going to do it like just like this. Pick up its leash. We're moving this way. We're going. Our energy is forward. Scott does this a ton with the bed exercise. It's so interesting to see if we're training the dog to go to the bed and we're sending the dog to the bed. He'll have the owner release the dog off the bed. The dog will be on the left side. Clockwise, you turn back to the bed. That owner, if their energy is moving towards the bed, they're committing, they're making that turn, they're heading towards the bed with the dog. The dog is like, okay, I'm going to the bed. I'm going to the bed. If they're unsure what they're doing or, you know, turning into the dog weird or they're apprehensive. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're stopped and they're, you know, waiting with their energy. That dog is not moving forward. That dog is not feeling confident. So when you have a fearful dog, you need to say, all right, this is my plan for one and two. I'm going to approach this confidently. And then another thing you have to say is, all right, if this is going to totally go in the gutter, like for instance, it's a hundred pound dog. You can't move the dog because it's too fearful. Then what are you going to do? You need to have a plan B. You need to be acting. Action is big when you have fear. If you're Mm. just sitting there kind of looking at the dog like, oh, I'm not sure, then that's going to have some fallout later on. I often say it's better to make a bad choice than no choice at all. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And I would say the same thing with a really confident dog. So uh, like really, I confident dogs are few and far between. Confidence dogs kind of have this like natural swagger that you don't really understand why they just, they kind of just seem cool, but they don't necessarily like come across like, oh, I'm really confident. And they're like outwardly confident. That's normally kind of like throwing errors, like the best defense is a good offense type of thing. Like that dog normally isn't confident. They're making up for some sort of fear, some sort of insecurity that they have. A confident dog that's really sure of itself. That's like, whatever, buddy, whatever you throw at me, I'm going to deal with. If you come in with too much confidence, now you guys can almost butt heads. It's almost like a couple that like, they're both a type A personality. I don't know anything about that. (laughs) I mean, <laughs> well, we're not we're both type A personalities, so that works out fine for us. But really, you're 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 seeing this where you have a confident dog. If you have an owner that comes in or a trainer that comes in and says, "Oh, well, that dog, you know, thinks that it's confident, but I'm as confident. I'm just more." And it becomes into this like power struggle I mean, and this muscling. You're not going to get anywhere with that either. So you have to be able to kind of segue these energies together so they're working in a symbiotic way. What were you going to say? I was going to say it. Uh, You know, another way of describing a confident dog is a dog that does not have fear controlling its behavior. If it's not Mm -hmm. fearful of noises and this and that and the other thing, the opposite is it's just comfortable and confident walking down the street. Yeah, a lot of times people almost say, oh, that dog's really dumb or that dog's really lazy, you know, like like a bulldog that just sleeps through everything. No, that dog just doesn't give a crap. That dog's just okay in its own skin. Mm -hmm. It's not just losing its mind every second of every day. I'll say the dumbest dog is probably smarter than... uh... A lot smarter than we give it credit for. Yeah, Let me put it that way. (laughs) The dumbest dog is a lot smarter than the smartest human, probably. Okay, so we're going now with kids. We're talking kids. Your dog has nervous energy with kids. What are you going to do? How are you going to kind of deal with that situation so everyone's safer? Well, one thing is, is stabilize the children. So we don't push kids on dogs. That's not like a real big thing that we care about. If our dogs aren't into the kids, it's like, all right, toss a cookie from five feet away, put our dog away. We're not trying to make that situation work. We don't care. 
But if the kid cannot be running and flailing and screaming and everything else, if they can sit down, if they can open their hand, like giving a horse, you know, a treat, their flat open hand, and then the dog can lick out of their hand, you're controlling the situation so it's less chaotic. You're calming the kid down so the kid isn't moving so furtively like, oh, I got to do this and get the dog and everything else. That crazy energy is starting to stir up and make the dog more nervous. You say to the kid, okay, open your hand, put your hand here. If they want to pull away, you can even just gently hold your hand underneath to give them more confidence because a lot of the times when they pull away quickly, whether they're administering a treat or handing a treat or the dog, they feel the tongue of the dog and they pull away that quick reaction makes the dog kind of get snappy or concerned. So all of these things are important to think about and to consider because these small changes can make all the difference in the world. Like really it's, it's, it's the, an issue of when you go into a shelter and you sense all that nervous energy versus, you know, you go into a vet's office and, you know, it's a quieter day and you don't sense nervous energy and everybody's having a good day there. And all the dogs have gone out healthy. Like dogs are sensing that right when they walk in, they have a great sense of smell. They definitely can feel energy. And the more that we can read how our dogs are changing their own behavior and their own attitudes based on the environment and what we're putting into their environment for them, the better off our dogs can be. Do you have any other thoughts on this well, that I we haven't touched on? If the dog can see that the parent has control of the child, the dog will be a little more comfortable mm-hmm. doing some controlled interactions with the child. If the parent can't control the child, um, the dog is going to be thinking I have to take care of myself yeah. because they're just letting this friggin' little monster jump all over my head and I need to stop that from happening. And kids, you know, they're not going to take direction under a certain age very well. And in my mind, it seems like six, seven years old is a turning point where even get, yeah, seven certainly, but there's a point where they understand what you're saying, okay, and they don't do it. <laughs> I got you. And they do whatever they want. And then there's a point where they understand what you want. They realize there's a consequence if they don't listen to their mom or dad. And then they actually do what you want. And then you can, that's when it's nice to have a dog. People get dogs and right when they have a baby and want to raise the dog and the baby together. It's a friggin' nightmare. It's nice if you have a child at a point where they take direction. They can eat on their own at a table without throwing food all over the place. And that's a great time to get a dog now. Because you need to kind of mold that kid's energy into what you should expect for the dog's energy to be. And I will say, guys, our number one thing about how you can change the tempo of your household, like right this moment, tonight, this weekend, you know, for the rest of February, whatever, 2021, is have some quiet time. Like quiet time is a big thing in our house. And without it, we are a lot less functional. It's one of my favorite phrases. (laughs) It is true. Quiet time. (laughs) Especially since I'm a yapper, he likes to say, all right, quiet time. Uh, But no, really, if you can just take three minutes, five minutes, no cell phone, just a moment with your dog, and you don't necessarily even just have to be petting your dog. It's almost better if your dog is just laying down resting and you're not necessarily interacting with your dog and you're both sharing that quiet space, you're both going to have a huge sense of relief in that moment, but it's going to be more restorative for the rest of your day. So even if that's something that you can't get on the same page as your husband and, you know, your multiple kids and, you know, your nanny and all that, if it's just you and the dog and you can find a minute, three minutes, five minutes, try it out, have a quiet moment, no technology, and just take a deep breath. Because breathing, if nothing else, really helps dogs when they're stressed at the vet, when they're in pain, when they're scared, anything else. Breathing is much better than just a lot of chatting. Getting your breathing in sync with your dog's breathing is a technique that you can use to calm both of you. Mm -hmm. Because the dog will start to reflect your breathing pattern. You're going to control the breathing pattern. In the beginning, you might start at, at maybe the dog's maybe a little bit of a pant, but you're going to try and get that dog to start to mirror your calm breathing and they're going to calm down with you. Yeah. The dogs are a reflection of your energy. Scott always says that and it's a good phrase. So check your energy, make sure it's where you want it to be. If you don't like the energy of the house, you have the power to change that today. Even if you've had eight years of crazy, you can change that today and you can have your dog start changing his behavior tomorrow. All right. So we will see you guys next week. We have a special guest next week. I'm super excited to share with you. In the meantime, if you need anything from us, studio at thequirkydog.com. And keep it quirky. Take care, guys. Peace. Peace. Check your energy. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.